our Bible class, so we're already behind schedule. I'm already losing time, and uh, if you remember how I teach, I usually don't get it all in, so I need every minute that, that I can get. So welcome uh, everyone here as we're going to continue our study uh, in the book of Philippians and Colossians this quarter, uh, and we'll be picking up, uh, reviewing a little bit uh, what you talked about last week, and then working our way through uh, almost all the first chapter. I don't expect us to get to the very end there, uh, but through most of it. Before we begin together, though, I ask Brother Genton, if he would, to just direct our minds in a, in a word of prayer before we begin our study. Brother Genton. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the day and the time together for the study of your word. Bless our brothers, he teaches. Help us to open our hearts, our minds, and our Bibles to the teaching of your word. Help us to make the application to our lives. Thank you for Jesus who suffered and bled and died on the cross for our sins. It is in his name we give thanks for all things, and we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ginn. So thank you, Ben, for, for kicking off. Last week I was out of the country, and so I uh, appreciate Ben starting, starting the class off and to get covering the background, the beginning uh, of the chapter. So just to get our minds refreshed and, and, and clicking this evening, uh, we, studied, we started uh, talking about the book of Philippians. Ben covers some of the background and information about the book. I hope you read through it. It's not a long read, uh, four chapters. Uh, I think it takes me about, you know, 25 minutes or something like that. So it's not a long read to get through. Where is Paul at now that he is writing this particular letter uh, to the Philippians? Just speak, uh, Tim. He's in prison, so he's in Rome, right? We believe he's, this was written from Rome uh, after he had uh, uh, sailed from um, uh, Caesarea in that area, uh, ended up in Rome, been in Rome uh, for some period of time. Uh, as we think about when the letter was written at this particular time, we talked about it being in the early 60s probably is our best guess. How long uh, had it been at this time when this letter is being written since Paul uh, started the church? How long has it been? Does anybody remember? About a decade right, per, per Brother Ben, about a decade, so 10 years ago, you remember when he was on his uh, second journey, the Macedonian call, uh, he, he sailed across, uh, and he taught uh, and, and started the church there uh, in Philippi, how long has it been since he's been last with them physically, what do you think, think about that, so on his last journey, before he returned to Jerusalem, um, how long has that been, Think about the time stamps. Now, he, you know, we got a couple good time stamps, right? In, at the end of Acts, he was uh, under arrest for how many years there with Felix, Festus, a group? Two years. Sailed to uh, Rome, may, maybe several months. We don't know the exact timing. And then how long has he been uh, in prison uh, now in, uh, in Rome, we think? A couple more years, right? So, uh, we think this is at the end of, of, uh, of that time in Rome based on his comments, based on his uh, encouraging comments that, hey, I think I might be uh, uh, released at that time. Uh, and so here we have Paul addressing this letter uh, to, to those in, in Philippi. What are some of the uh, themes that you could uh, come up with as we read through the book of Philippians? You talked about this a little bit. Um, uh, last, last week. What kind of themes do we see uh, in the book of Philippians? What's the main one? Probably it's a book about what? Rejoicing, Rejoicing about joy, uh, right? And uh, so that's probably the main, if I can, hopefully, there we go. It, it's a letter of joy, right? Philippians 4, and f uh, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So it uses that term joy and rejoicing uh, about 12 times in the letter. And that's a typical uh, title, if you will, or theme uh, that's given by the book. Another thing that we see in there is it's a letter of love. Some people actually call it a love letter. Uh, it, it's quite different than some of other Paul's epistles as he writes to the Philippians, as he opens the letter and, and just discusses with him. But we see the great love and tenderness here. He, he speaks in verse uh, one, chapter uh, of uh, verse eight of chapter one. For God is my witness, how long for you all how I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ, that deep love. He longs for them just as Christ loved us. That's how Paul longs for uh, the brethren. So we see that. Another thing that I I'll mention and bring up, it's quite interesting. If you think about it, if you pay attention as you read through, you can pick up different words and phrases that, that repeat throughout the book, but it's a letter in view of the gospel. Uh, Paul mentions uh, up to 
nine times, uh, depending upon your translation, where he talks about the good news or the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. In verse 12 there of chapter 1, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Everything that Paul did was in view of his work, his charge uh, of being a preacher of the gospel, his stewardship, right? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4 of the gospel uh, that he'd been put in charge with. So we see that throughout uh, the, the passage. But consider that joy, love, Paul's excitement. Um, think about his circumstances, right? Where is he? We talked about it. He's in prison. Uh, he's suffering the infirmities of, uh, of old age. That's a, that's a sneak-in passage from Philemon, uh, verse 9, uh, written uh, during this same period. But um, he still speaks of great joy, even though he's suffering so greatly. What about the Philippians' perspective, right? Poor, persecuted, threatened. They were going through some of the same things. But yet what? He told them to rejoice. Well, how, how, how can we do that? Why, how can Paul be so joyful in the state and condition he is in? Uh, and how can he expect the Philippians to rejoice considering their state, their persecution, the things that they're going through? This is a great underlying theme of the whole book as well. Ben? Uh, view of the gospel. So mm-hmm. if everything he is experiencing and looking at is in view of the gospel, then, then that changes his perspective and that should change theirs and ours. And, and Absolutely. Help. Absolutely. We'll get over when we get over in chapter four. We're going to talk about contentment, right? Uh, and, and one of the things that's a, those are great points, Ben, because it's true. He, he was he was there as a servant of Jesus Christ. His focus was where on heavenly things, right? Serving the Lord, uh, and, and so it didn't matter what his circumstance was. Uh, he, he, was, he was happy in life or death because in both senses he, he was the Lord, right? Romans 14 and verse 8. Uh, and so that was Paul's attitude. But this is an underlying theme uh, of the book. The joy of a Christian is not dependent upon circumstances, right? Um, but it exists in spite of them. That's how uh, Paul, if you, if you think about that, that statement, um, his circumstances didn't change his attitude. If you, if you read the, the letters of Paul in, in the history. Uh, and, and that's the way we need to think about our circumstances, right? Uh, when we get over and study contentment, right? How, we're supposed to view contentment not based upon uh, our circumstance. If I'm, if I'm needy in need or if I'm overly abundant with extra, right, I still have the responsibility to be content. It's not, it doesn't matter about the circumstance. And that what we see, that's what we see Paul uh, here emphasizing, I think, uh, throughout the letter uh, as we look through this. I'm going to skip through, uh, since we, we got started short, I'm going to skip quickly through a couple slides. But just some of the key things you remember, just to, to remind us, right? What, did, uh, what are some of the things that Paul uh, writes about here as he goes through? Well, he writes to, to thank them for their generosity, right? We'll talk about Epaphrodites uh, and the things that he did uh, there as we get later on the book to commend them Um, You know, he sends back Epaphrodites early, right? He had been sick. He was concerned. They were concerned about Epaphrodites. Uh, They wanted to know about the state of Paul. He sends them back, and 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 we'll study that as we get over into chapter 2. He encourages them to remain steadfast in persecution. Uh, They had uh, seen the persecution that had happened to Paul in Acts chapter 16. They were going through the same type of persecution, and now here Paul's in prison, uh, and they're still continuing to support him to encourage, to unite. They had a problem with unity. They had some trouble going on. They have two sisters we'll talk about in chapter 4 and verse 2. Uh, and, and they should do all things with, with, without grumbling, right? Uh, and, and so we see some unity issues. And certainly we'll talk a little bit about the warning that he gives in chapter 3. They had some problems with false teaching, false doctrine, which is not surprising uh, as we think about uh, this particular area. Um, what is unique about the salutation to the Philippians? One quick question, and we're going to move on. If you remember verses 1 and 2, what is the one unique thing in the book of Philippians that you see in regard to the salutation that you don't see in any other book of the Bible? Kyle? The brethren there, that it's, it consists of saints, overseers, and deacons. He's addressing the letter. Right, and so this is, he, he addresses all the brethren. He addresses the church, the, or, the organization, the structure of the church. That's what we see. It's made up of saints. It's made up of elders, overseers, 
uh, bishops, elders, right, and, and deacons. And so we see that uniqueness uh, as Paul goes through and addresses uh, the brethren, and that's, that's important uh, as we think about the, these things. He calls himself a bond servant, and that's another point that I want to skip, uh, skip over, if you, if you don't mind, uh, for time purposes. Uh, in verses 3 through 5, we see this thanksgiving that Paul gives, and this is, this is quite, quite miraculous to me, or, or awesome to me is a better word, not miraculous, but, but we see this thanksgiving. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering my prayer with you in joy, uh, in every prayer uh, for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day uh, until now. I mean, take note how the Apostle Paul prays here with great joy. Right? He's, so, he's so joyful, he's rejoicing. And again, remember his circumstances. And we see that uh, in this prayer. Remember back to Acts chapter 16, 10 years ago? Do you see any change in Paul's disposition when he's undergoing suffering? when he's undergoing prison time uh, and abuse. What happened in Acts uh, 16, and I put the passage up, verse 25. He was worshiping with who? Silas, remember. Paul and Silas prayed and were singing uh, praises at midnight when they were in prison in Acts chapter 16. And and here we have Paul writing from prison, uh, and and he writes this great letter of love and joy and tells him to rejoice uh, and, and to be happy and to consider Uh, consider their work, consider their suffering as something uh, that's beneficial to them, right? That's going to build them up uh, and and give them good and great temperance. So it's interesting uh, as we see that, of course, you talked last week, we're not going to spend time there about that participation, that fellowship, right, uh, that they had. And Paul is so thankful for that. Such an important part of the work of the church today. uh, As we understand what uh, the elders here uh, have selected men that we support uh, and, and we have fellowship with them in, in that activity. And Paul is so grateful uh, here as he had received many times uh, support uh, from those at Philippi, while sometimes not accepting support from places uh, that it would not be beneficial, as, as Ben taught us from uh, the Corinthian letter uh, the last couple quarters. And so we see that significance. He's so confident, um, and, and, and this is another interesting thing uh, that we see. He said, for I am confident of this very thing. Uh, it's perfect tense. Paul, Paul has the expectation. Uh, he has the experience that God is going to complete the work that he had begun uh, in the Philippian brethren, right? Uh, they, they, they had, uh, there's a lot of different opinions on what, what the uh, completing the work means here. Is that, does that include salvation their salvation specifically of the individual, or, or is it a, a combination of their conversion to Christ, but their work that they had started, their, their support of Paul, their participation uh, in the faith. Um, wh- wherever you may stand with that, or it's a combination of, uh, of both of those or all of that, uh, Paul is very confident that God is going to complete the work that he has for them to do. Uh, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to last. It's going to continue on until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and we see that uh, because of the, the excellent evangelistic work, the eagerness of, of the people in Philippi. Uh, it, those in Mac- Macedonia, Paul praises the Thessalonians for their evangelistic work. Uh, and, and so we see that same type of thing here uh, with uh, the brethren in Philippians. I'm going to uh, skip by this because you talked about it last week. I think where you kind of started to leave off last week is, is Paul's prayer here. Let's read this together uh, in chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11, let's, let's think about a few things together uh, in this great prayer. Uh, let me get my pages caught up here with myself. Now, you, you may note, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I do have everything up in the New American Standard. Uh, if you're wondering, no, I have not switched from the King James, but I figured I would, I would uh, put the New American Standard up to make it a little easier for those that may not uh, uh, be used to reading that. So uh, if I read something, sometimes I insert the wrong word thinking it's, my, it's, out of my, it's out of the Bible that I'm familiar with, so bear with me. From the New American Standard, let's read together, beginning in verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent uh, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What is Paul praying for here? Now, we can go through and define the words and all those things, but 
what is he praying here for the brethren? What do you think he's praying for? Kind of a jump up, like a summary. Tim, what do you think? Knowledge and understanding, okay. Spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, right? I think that, that's the intent. He's praying for uh, their continued spiritual progress. Um, how important is that? I mean, think, uh, their situation, we, we're not in their situation, right? We don't, we're not suffering necessarily the type of physical persecution uh, that, that uh, the brethren at this particular time were suffering. But how is it, think about the importance. Paul took the time uh, and, and the detail uh, to sit there and pray that your love may abound still more. They were doing, they, he didn't condemn them for much of anything. There's a little, some trouble they, that he was correcting, I think, but, but he wants them to abound more. Remember, he, uh, Paul prayed the same thing to the Thessalonians, right? He praised them for being so evangelistic and, 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 and loving one another, but he says what? Increase more, be overflowing. Uh, and, and that's what we see here of this great prayer uh, as we think about uh, the apostle and, and what he's praying for here. Love, this love, I pray that your love may abound. I think we all understand what uh, agape love is. That's, that's not emotional love. It's a love that goes beyond emotion, seeks the best for its uh, object. It's, it's selfless, uh, as we un understand. It's sacrificial, but it's interesting to note. He prays that their love may abound still more and more, yet but where at? In knowledge and discernment. In knowledge and discernment. Love must be educated within the channels of knowledge and discernment. So today, think about today. When people talk about love, what is usually <laughs> the reaction of some in the, let's call it the religious world, um, uh, when, we, when we hold to the fact that, hey, there is one set of doctrine, there's one set of teaching, we're all going to be judged by the same standard, there's not, uh, there's not multiple uh, uh, denominations on the branch, uh, in Jesus' uh, uh, explanation of, of the, in John chapter 15. So, so what, what will people use love for? Well, they'll say that kind of teaching that you just mentioned is too restrictive. Okay. So used to, to do what? To expand, right? So, so here the apostle is encouraging them that their love may abound, be overflowing, right? Still more and more, but yet in the, in the channels of knowledge and discernment, right? So it's not just, uh, you know, we, we've used the term before, love is blind, okay? When we're, when, we're, when we're talking about maybe when we're in love with someone, uh, teenage love or young love, love is blind. You, you kind of lose your mind. But that's, not what, that's not what this is, right? Love is, love is to abound in knowledge and discernment, not to be used to open up the bounds or the restrictions uh, of, uh, of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. And, and so if, you, if you've spent any time discussing the issues with anyone, uh, whether you go back and have studied the issues from the past on uh, institutional things, you know, the uh, uh, supporting of orphans' homes from the, from the church. What was one of the top arguments that was made during that time? Well, you just don't love the children, right? So you see how you're trying to use love to broaden, as Ben mentioned, uh, the fellowship. Same thing today with homosexuality and the things that are going on today. Well, you just don't love them. You don't accept them. Uh, and, and that's just not true. We do love them because we're trying to teach them the truth uh, and save their soul. That's the love that we are to grow uh, and, and to abound in as, as we think about that. But the idea, again, we can go through and, and define uh, these terms, but to keep overflowing, to abound in knowledge, right? Spiritual uh, comprehension of truth, discernment. Uh, and, and look at why we do that. So that we may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless in the day of Christ. So we're to train ourselves, we're to increase in, in our love and knowledge and discernment uh, so that we can uh, approve or prove things that are excellent, things that are brother. Brother Gittin. There's two parts to Paul's prayer here, mm -hmm. which you've already covered in uh, verses uh, 4 to 7, 4 to 8. There's God's part, and here his prayer is for the brethren doing their part, and his prayer, his earnest prayer is for God to continue this good work and for them to get busy and do this good work. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great point, a great way to look at it, right? Paul had confidence in the ability of God to complete the work he wanted to complete. Well, how was he going to do that? Well, he's going to do that through those that have been converted to Christ 
and the brethren, and Paul's encouraging them, hey, you've got to increase in this area uh, so, that you can, so that you can be uh, to approve things that are, are excellent in order to be sincere. What does it mean to be sincere? Without blemish, right? Pure. That, that's the way we want to be. That, that, that word carries with it. I was doing some uh, uh, Kevin side study on the language um, uh, on that word. It's actually uh, uh, from the Latin. It's like without wax. You know, when they used to make things uh, back in the day, uh, granite and other things, you, and you could hold them up to the sun and see the impurities. Well, they'd, they would fill it with stuff when you're looking at it down here. So when, when, you're, when you're sincere, right, you're able to stand the test, right? You're pure. You're, with, you're without uh, uh, gall and, and any type of impurity in, in, in yourself. That's sincerity, right, Brother Ben? sincere and how they accepted the word there was knowledge and so you know they already had that mindset and now he's continuing I want you to continue to have this kind of heart right. Right. Uh, right. you had that at the beginning uh, keep it going Yeah, it, it's that idea of growing I mean we, we talk about growing all the time right if you're not growing you're dying or if you're sitting still you're, 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 you're falling behind right so 2 Peter 3 and verse eight, 18 right grow in the grace and knowledge uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to do that. They have to continue uh, to increase uh, and, and abound in, in this discernment. Uh, the, you know, we got to be able to prove things. Th- think about some, pa- think of for a moment, uh, what passages can you think of that use the word prove? First Thessalonians chapter 5, prove all things in what? Hold fast, right, to, to those things which are good. So we are to be proving and to testing. That same word is used in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 when it's talking about examining yourself, proving yourself that you're in the faith. Uh, and so to be able to do that, we've got to have discernment. We've got to have knowledge right, of, of, of God's word, and that's the standard. Uh, and that's what uh, I think Paul's encouraging them, as Brother Genton said, Paul's, Paul's encouraging them to grow in this area. Brother Hugh? To note that the sincerity comes after approving things which are excellent. It's not <laughs> whatever I'm doing, I'm sincere about it, but it has to stand that test. So I, I, I uh, St- Stephen's not here, is he? I don't, I don't see him. My eyes aren't working good, but he sent that article out. If you read the article by Brother Heath Rogers on, you know, will, uh, I forget the title of it, but will sincerity save you or will the, will the sincere be saved? I can't remember the title, but to your point, right, it, it's not, hey, I, you know, yeah, I'm sincere. I believe it, and you know, I'm. I, I, it, it's what I think, but it's not according to. It's not according to the standard. You haven't approved what's excellent, right? According to the standard, uh, and, and that's a great point, uh, brother Hugh. Any other, any other thoughts or comments on it? Uh, yeah, brother Stu. No, that's that's a that's a that's a great point, and I, I think I was talking to, to Ben maybe at, at some point we were talking about the makeup of the people in Philippi, right? Uh, and they're at it. They're, I think one of the reasons uh, that they excelled spiritually, if you will, uh, and, and have done a good job is is their background. They were retired soldiers, ex-soldiers. They were they were um, Roman citizens, right? They they had that. Uh, uh, they had that thing that, hey, we're, we're, we're Rome, we're important, we're going to act like we should. But then when they were converted to the gospel, they carried on that same type of attitude. It's kind of like Paul. Paul had great zeal, right? Of course, he was wrong for a period of time when he was uh, blaspheming and, and, uh, and condemning the church. But here we have this great example, right, of the Philippians uh, and their spiritual desire to serve and be a bondservant uh, like Paul. Uh, and I think that's such a, gr- a great thing. That's a great point, uh, Stu. Uh, as you think about that. Um, and, and of course, the point is, and the, the, the whole goal is, is to be blameless, you know, until the day of Christ. That's something uh, that's continual. That's that, that growing and abounded, uh, abounding will continue. We need to overflow uh, a, a, as we think about uh, that idea. If we move forward, uh, let's look now 
Paul changes gears here. We kind of get into the body uh, of the letter a little bit more as we pick up here uh, in verse 12 together. Uh, Let's read together uh, chapter 1. Just checking my time there. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Beginning there, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment... Uh, in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole uh, Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have a uh, far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Again, Paul's changing gears here a little bit, and he's talking about the state of the gospel. His work, um, he knew, uh, I'm sure, from Epaphroditus that the Philippians were concerned about Paul. They knew he was in prison. They sent Epaphroditus to Rome uh, with, with an offering and to support Paul. And so they were quite concerned. So here I think he's, he's expounding on what's going on with Paul, right? They know, they know he's bound and in chains uh, here in Rome. It might appear to the Philippians, it might appear to others that were looking on that, hey, this is not good. Paul, Paul's in Paul's imprisonment has severely curtailed his ability to preach the gospel, right? That may, maybe that's what some thought, or maybe that's what Paul was thinking. Well, what do we see from Paul? Um, we see that the, the progress is being made, that advancement uh, in, in the gospel is being made. I asked the question, what does Paul mean by the greater progress of the gospel, right? What, 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 does that, what, what do we see him talking about here when we think about the progress of the gospel, who who is being who is being influenced by the gospel, brother Stu? <laughs> exactly. So he's he's. Uh, I read uh, a lot of background information, but you know he was handcuffed to a guard, chained to a guard. They would rotate every four or six hours, depending upon who you're reading. Uh, Twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. He had somebody hooked to him. Right. And so they were going to hear him no matter what. (laughs) And so I am sure just as his influence he had uh, in Caesarea. Right. What did what did Agrippa say about Paul if he hadn't appealed to Caesar? He'd have been let go. Right. They would they would have seen Paul's innocence uh, that he wasn't a troublemaker, trouble, troublemaker. I'll get out rabble rouser or whatever, whatever you want to call him. But uh, that he was honestly a bondservant of Jesus. He was trying to teach the truth. Uh, he wasn't causing problems, stirring up issues uh, like they had charged him. So the, the Praetorian Guard was influenced. Who else? Who are the others? Who do you think the others are there? If I make sure I use the right words. Uh, uh, everyone else, sorry. Others. The Jews rejected him in Acts 28. At least some of them did, but you know, he had a great opportunity with the Gentiles. Absolutely. Who do we read about? In the book of Philemon, that would be considered another, uh, uh, some, uh, somebody else, the other. Who, who did Paul convert? Onesimus, right? Is it, go, Brother Genton, yeah, go ahead. It's one of those verses that really causes you to sit there and reflect and, and really just let your mind run more. Imagine in between those uh, chains to the soldiers, and he's writing this letter. And <laughs> Him talking, right? Absolutely. And just so, there's just so much that you can think about. Paul is going to keep his mouth shut. He can't keep him shut. But he's not like, like you said, not like these other prisoners they have guarded. Right, right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. They, they were, I, I read um, uh, an author, and, and he made the point, you know, think about this. Um, and we'll talk a minute in a minute here about providence because I think there's some providence involved in, in the activities with Paul. But think about it. what if Paul would have, you know, he desired to go to Rome, remember? Uh, he, he said, you know, I, I want to go to Rome. He, when he wrote to the Romans, he said, I want to come. I, I, I want to I teach you. I want to preach the gospel to you. I'm in debt to you. Um, what if he would have showed up in Rome the normal way and ended up in the Roman Forum preaching and teaching, which he would have, right, without fear. How many of the Praetorian Guard do you think would have stopped for long enough to get anything 
out of what Paul said other than probably keeping the people under control because they were all stirred up mad at him, right? So what a great influence, right? For two years, he had somebody chained to him and how much influence. And he sends greeting. He sends greetings, right? I'm sure uh, I can hardly believe that there wasn't conversion made, uh, uh, some of those folks or maybe their family members or, or whoever uh, that Paul had influenced. The Praetorian Guard, not only that, but also look at verse 14, right? Look at for and most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. We've heard the term, you know, courage breeds courage. Um, uh, you know, when you're with a bunch of folks, you know, you see this in kids all the time, the younger gen, you know, when, when they're in a, in a big group, everybody's pretty cur- courageous, right? Uh, when you separate um, and you're by yourself or you're with, with, with those that are more reserved, then, then you kind of take on uh, uh, that type of uh, mentality. But here we see uh, this, this great courage now because of his, Paul's example. Well, look, Paul's chained in there, right? Uh, he can't go anywhere. Um, if they've probably heard about the last four, you, you know, period of time where he's been in prison uh, in Caesarea and the things that, that he was shipwrecked and, and all those things. Now here he is in Rome uh, under arrest, under house arrest, waiting, waiting for that decision. But look, look at the influence uh, that he has. Hey, hey, that's, I, I understand Paul was appointed to preach the gospel, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, I'm going to participate in that work, right? I'm going to do the same thing, Brother Ben. A couple of things. One, I think it's a great example of how good can still come out of uh, suffering. And exactly. It's, it's not always what we think, even with evangelism, you know, the way that God works, like with the eunuch on the road. Space at times, but other yeah, I, I mean the stuff that I and, and it's all speculation, right? Because I, I don't know, but the the stuff that I have read, based upon those that are were familiar with the Roman policies uh, and, and and what they required for somebody that had appealed to Caesar, right? And they he was in the Praetorian. He didn't have just you know he couldn't just wander around. He was hooked to somebody. That that's my understanding now. I don't have a passage or, a, or other than from what I've read. Brother, Brother Dane? Yeah. Speculation almost romanticizes Paul being in Rome and in a prison. We yeah. kind of forget Romans are trained soldiers. That oh. So as I read this, I look at it not so much from the Roman perspective. I see it more from the brethren's perspective. And the perception I'm getting here is he's yeah. reminding them that, hey, listen, you just came upon Christianity where the dominant religion of the day is Judaism. And here comes this thing about Jesus Christ, which was initially called the way. So now you're seeing here is this guy who's preaching it, and he's locked up. He's being locked up for preaching that message. I mean, all of us just have to sit back and think, this is like how, how we feel we're going to deal with this. So here he's encouraging them to see that one, even the Romans recognize he's not guilty. Right. He's innocent. He was locked up for, there is no proof on that. So I, when I look at verse 12, I look at it not from a romanticizing point, it's just mostly that they know he's not guilty and he's innocent. It's just because Jews have a problem with what he's teaching about mm-hmm. Judaism. So they just dismiss this. And the other brethren now are being encouraged that Paul is not whimpering and like sitting in jail like, oh, who is me? Why am I locked up? Why is this happening to me? No, he's like, He's bold, he's brave, he's courageous, and he's joyful. Some other men are now taking courage from that. It's like, well, wait a minute. This religion that Paul is preaching must be the right way. Right. So yeah. that's kind of great. great. That's, that's, that's great points. And, and like, yeah, who was chained to who, right? I, <laughs> think, think about it that way, right? Who was really chained to who, right? Uh, God used the Paul's, ch- just like he used uh, uh, Moses' staff, just like he used uh, those in the Old Testament. We can talk about the providence of Joseph, you know, Ruth, Esther, and others. Right? I, ben mentioned Acts chapter 8, the, the hand of God in the, in the conversion of the, uh, of the eunuch. And so, so we see that. And, and I, put up, I put up there, um, you know, what do we see at work in Paul's life? And, and I can't but think about the providence of God, right, in controlling all of this. Uh, it through his providence. Paul had the desire to go to Rome. Now, he didn't get there probably the way he thought he was going to get there, but you remember the Lord spoke to him 
uh, in Acts, uh, the 23rd chapter, and told him, you're going to see Rome, right? But maybe Paul didn't understand <laughs> the manner that he was going to get there. So we see, we see this great providence uh, of God. Uh, and, 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 you know, even, even though he was bound, you know, Paul, Paul's bound again in prison. Finally, if, if, we, if we consider 2 Timothy, the, the fifth prison epistle, he's in prison in, in, in chapter uh, 2 there that I have up on the screen, verses 8 through 12. He talks about, you know, even though he is bound, what's not bound? The gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, and that's the, that's, the, that's the key point. I think that people, as Dane mentioned, every, everybody's been mentioning, uh, they've seen that. They've got they had great courage from that uh, and seeing Paul's example. Uh, and, and what does that tell us? What, is that, what's that, what example is that for me and you, right? Uh, when we're suffering or going through tribulation or, you know, whatever it may be uh, in, in our life, what a great example. Uh, what, if, uh, what if somebody goes through such a hard tragedy, whether it's in marriage or, or health, and comes out on the other side of it, and you've noticed that they've got stronger, they're more spiritual, um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, so that they've grown because of that suffering and, and persecution. Uh, and so that was Paul. I mean, Paul's attitude was always, hey, I'm going to serve no matter what the circumstance. Right? I, I'm going to glorify, and I know we're, run, we're waning in time, but um, I'm going to glorify God. That was, his, that was his point, and we'll get to that in a minute. But in life or in death, what, it, what was Paul's objective? It was to bring glory to God, right? Whether he stayed and lived uh, they let him live, and he, he'd come see the Philippians physically uh, and in person, or whether he lost his life for, for their sake because he was preaching the gospel. Uh, he didn't care as long as he was serving God, right? That's, that's what, uh, that was his total objective. Thanks. I'm gonna, we're going to keep going. Uh, sorry, I've seen some hands up. Uh, I just want to try to slip through a few more uh, slides here so that I'm not terribly behind after my first class. <laughs> so Philippians 8, uh, 15 through 18, um, we see some interesting things here. Paul's got some rivals in Rome, but we're not talking about the rivals, uh, you know, Dane mentioned about those that were following after Judaism. We're not talking about the, the folks that, that he talks about in chapter 3 now, right? That's a different discussion. That's the false teachers, that's the Judaizers that teach in false doctrine. But here Paul has some rivals in Rome, Look here, picking up in verse 15, he's talking about the, the impact uh, of his being in prison and his influence, and it says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, that's the ones that are teaching from goodwill, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. They knew Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. They knew, and he had mentioned to the Corinthians, I mentioned already 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, that his stewardship, he, he understood that he had a stewardship, and it was to preach the gospel. Woe is me. What did it say in chapter uh, 9 and verse, uh, come on, Ben, help me. I don't remember, 26, 27, 28. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. That was Paul's comment, right? 27, thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, so we see that the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. There's a lot of rejoicing going on. Why is he rejoicing? Because of what? Let's just be clear, right? He's rejoicing because Christ is being preached. Who was preaching Christ of the two groups that he just mentioned? This is, this is important to understand because there's a lot of trouble uh, people will find in this passage if you don't keep, it, keep the, the subject right of what we're talking about here. Did both those groups teach price, Christ? Those were, that were teaching pre under pretentious and wanted to put burden on Paul, were they preaching Christ? Right? Those that out of love were preaching Christ. So what are we talking about? What is the contrast in this section of Scripture? What's Paul upset about, Tim? He's exactly. He's talking about motive. Paul is contrasting, uh, and I thought I had a bunch of lines that were going to come up, but I guess I got them out of sync. But if you just look at the contrasts that we just read through, he's talking about motive, their intent. Why, why were they preaching? Well, one group was preaching out of love. They knew what Paul's mission was. They knew, they knew um, uh, what he was about. Right, that he's, he was a bond servant of Jesus Christ. But the other, 
the other here, and these, these are brethren. You have to consider these as being some of the brethren. Uh, there's a lot of speculation. We're not told in the Scriptures exactly what is meant to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Now, what exactly was the exact motive and what was the pressure they were putting on Paul? You, you can read a whole bunch of different people on that. Were they um, preaching Christ, keeping the, uh, the, the, the people stirred up in Rome about Jesus Christ? Therefore, it puts more pressure on Paul because why is he in prison for preaching Christ? I, I, I don't know. Was it to make, uh, were they jealous of Paul? It talks about they preached from envy right? Um, were they jealous of his success and the influence he had, even though he was hanging off of a Roman guard uh, and what he was doing? Uh, some, one, one writer referenced or talked about, well, maybe these were le even leaders of the church in Rome, uh, and they were jealous of Paul's um, success and, and work. I, I, I don't know what it is. All we know is they were preaching for the wrong motive, but Paul says, but what does he say there in, in, in verse 4? What then? Did it bother Paul? What does it matter? That's Paul's, that's the statement there. What, who, who cares? That's Paul's attitude, right? So they're not affecting Paul at all. The, whatever pressure they think they might be putting on him because they were preaching Christ, Paul was just happy that Christ was being preached, right? That, that's what he was happy about. Uh, and, and, and but, but the important thing here is, is to keep the balance right on what the motive is, as Brother Tim said. We're not talking about... Pretense or in truth is not error versus doctrine, right? Pretense and truth in verse 18, that's talking about uh, disguising the motive, which takes you back to verse 17. Truth uh, it goes back to verses 15 and 16, uh, 16 because out of love and out of goodwill. Again, it's motive that we're being, that's being talked about here. This is not a camping ground. We're going to continue next week. This is not a camping ground. To discuss, and this goes to Brother Heath's article that Stephen sent out. This is not a camping ground to discuss about, hey, if one is sincere, and as long as you're sincere, if you're wrong, it's, it's okay, right? We've seen that in the church, right? You see that with, um, uh, it's, we've, it's happened to gospel preachers, it's happened to elders, it's happened to the saints, that uh, even though they're sincere and, and they wholeheartedly believe it, and that's the conclusion they come to, guess what? The Apostle Paul was sincere, wasn't he? But he was wrong uh, until the Lord spoke to him on the road. Thank you for your uh, attention tonight. Finish, um, we're going to finish out chapter 1 and uh, that first section in unity in chapter 2 for next week. Thank you for your comments and your attention.